Father, once again, we want to thank you for being the God that you are and always being there for us and promising to always stay by our side as a friend that sticks closer than a brother. You promise never to leave us nor to forsake us. Once we have turned from our sin and trusted in you, Savior, we thank you so much for that promise. We claim that today. May we find deep, deep comfort in that as we look into your word today to look at this difficult topic that may dredge up some unpleasant memories for a number of folks here today. Father, I pray that you'd speak to our hearts. I ask, Lord, that you'd help us to be open to what you have to say to us by your Holy Spirit, and that we would find comfort and security and rest in you, that we would be drawn closer to each other, but especially drawn closer to you today. For we ask it all in Jesus' name and for his sake and with thanksgiving. Amen. We are in this series called The Rest of the Story, and as I have mentioned, we base this on uh, the, the idea, the topic anyway, on a series of radio broadcasts by Paul Harvey years ago in which he talked about the rest of the story. Here's a sample of that today. Now, the rest of the story. Not many men can say they made it into the dictionary, but John Calvin did. Calvin John, Calvinism, Calvinist, Calvinistic, and there are more. Testimony to the worldwide impact of that man. You'll recall he was a Protestant reformer. The theological guidelines which delineate the Presbyterian Church are his, and yet he bestowed upon the world a secular something for which he is rarely given credit. That's the rest of the story. Those who are not familiar with the life of John Calvin presume him to be English or perhaps German, but he was French. His real name was Jean Calvin. He was born in the early 16th century, educated in the humanities and in law. Because of his conversion to the Protestant Reform, he was forced to flee his native France. His first major work was written in exile at the age of 27. It was called Institutes of the Christian Religion, and in successive expansions it became the manual of Protestant theology for hundreds of years to come. Now I'd like to switch our focus to the nation, and specifically to the city in which John Calvin was exiled. When the young reformer arrived, he discovered that hard times had arrived first. Merchants had drifted away. Industry was stagnant. What once had been a flourishing center of commerce had become a ghost town. But not far behind John Calvin was a tidal wave of persecuted French Protestants who had also fled their native land, and these fellow fugitives of Calvin's were mostly craftsmen. A great number were goldsmiths. They were welcomed to their adopted community most enthusiastically because they were Protestants, yes, but especially because the town required artisans to reawaken its hibernating economy. And then just as the goldsmiths were about to produce the finery, which might have put that city back on the map, John Calvin laid down the law. There were already too many vanities in the world, he declared. Therefore, the wearing of jewelry by women and gold-laced coats by men was strictly forbidden. Furthermore, goldsmiths were prohibited from using false stones in their craft, from making hollow rings, also from manufacturing crosses and chalices and other instruments serving the popery. And Calvin's followers obeyed. Not only that, the reformer actually managed to get those restrictions passed into law, local, secular law. But John Calvin's glitter ban was not to impede economic recovery, quite the opposite, in fact. For the goldsmiths, searching for a sanctioned outlet for their craft, teamed up with the French Protestant watchmakers, and together they produced the most exquisite, the most precise mechanical timepieces that the world had ever seen. This, then, was the other gift of John Calvin, that for which he has not been remembered until today. That prior to his arrival in Geneva, Switzerland, clockmakers were scarce. It is axiomatic now that nothing is more elegant 
And in fact, nothing runs more smoothly than does a Swiss watch. You've heard that said all your life. Well, now you know the rest of the story. Yeah, let's just a sample. Uh, there's always more to the story than meets the eye, isn't there? And so that's what this series is all about. Sometimes we have perceptions that are not always uh, the case. I mean, the, 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 in reality with truth. And so we want to look at the rest of the story when it comes to this topic today. We're talking about rejection, dealing with rejection and different types of it. I'm just looking at three different types today. Uh, there are others as well, but we want to look at three and we want to dive right into the scripture with our first blank, looking at Samuel, Samuel and the misplaced feelings of rejection. Samuel and the misplaced feelings of rejection. What do I mean by that? Well, here we go. Have you ever been rejected? Just me? Oh, man, I'm just preaching myself today. Okay? <laughs> but I think sometimes, uh, I, I think maybe all of us have experienced rejection at some point of different kinds. Could be all, all kinds of different ways you might have been rejected. Maybe it works, somebody else got the promotion you were looking for. Maybe uh, the, the company was promoting from within. They, they posted an assignment. I've worked in places like this before where there, there was a bulletin board outside the HR office and, and they would post a, an internal opening and they would look for internal candidates before they looked outside, right? You've probably been there. And so you and maybe somebody else uh, in the company uh, applied for that job and interviewed for that job and the other person got it and you didn't. Sometimes it's not just a promotion. Maybe it's a job itself. Maybe you have put applications in a different places and interviewed for positions in different companies and someone else got the job and you didn't. And so you felt rejected as, as a, a result of that. Uh, maybe uh, when you were younger, oh, maybe it's going on now, but the, sometimes <laughs> this, this often happens in school, could have been middle school, could have been high school, could have been college. Maybe you were interested in someone. Uh, guys, maybe you were interested in some girl at college. Girls, maybe you're some interested in some guy in high school, and somebody else got that person. They chose to be with somebody else instead of you. And so you felt the rejection personally from that. Maybe in your family, you felt like your parents liked your siblings better than you. Sometimes parents have favorite kids. They're not supposed to. You know, it's not supposed to, and even if we do, we're not supposed to ever let it show, right? But sometimes kids might feel like they, they like their, uh, a sibling better. Or maybe your parents totally rejected you for whatever reason. It does happen. Maybe they just didn't want you at all. And so you're feeling keenly those, those feelings of rejection. And as you know, and so some of those feelings that I just talked about in my prayer a minute ago, they're starting to dredge up, aren't they? As you remember some of that rejection, it's hard to deal with things like that. But I want to point out that sometimes that's not reality. Sometimes it's not about you at all. Sometimes that rejection is about others. For example, when it comes to the job, the job promotion, or maybe just getting the job at all, maybe if you knew the whole picture, the rest of the story, and, and oftentimes we don't know that because we don't know what, what's in HR's mind when they're interviewing somebody. We don't know exactly what they're looking for, the type of person they're looking for. Maybe you weren't the right person for the job. Maybe your qualifications weren't there. Maybe your temperament wasn't there. Who knows? Some, we're not always told the rest of the story, but maybe it's not about you at all. Maybe it's about the job. How about that other someone, that certain special someone who chose someone else instead of you? I, uh, I, I, we don't always know uh, what happens years later, but maybe that person who rejected you, uh, looking back now years later, maybe you have reason to be glad if you knew the rest of the story that they didn't choose you. We don't always know. Because you don't know what turned out. Uh, later on 
in their life and, and the way they turned out, and the way, way they grew up after you left middle school or high school. And when it comes to your siblings, sometimes our perceptions are not what they should be either. If you are, let's say, the middle child or youngest child and you had older siblings, uh, and when you were younger, your mom maybe gave you both a cup of milk and you noticed that their cup seemed to have a little bit more milk in it, maybe it's not because she liked them better. It might be because they were much bigger than you and could have more milk. And it's not about you at all. Maybe the reason that the, your, your older sibling got new clothes and you didn't was not because they liked your older sibling more, but maybe they couldn't afford to get all the kids in the family all new clothes at the same time, but instead they got the older child new clothes because they outgrew the old ones and you got the hand-me-downs. Does anybody remember hand-me-downs? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe it's not about you at all. Maybe it's about the, the fact your parents didn't have the finances to, to buy all new clothes for everybody. So sometimes our, mis, our perceptions are misplaced is what I'm trying to get across. Sometimes they are true. I'm not saying that, but sometimes, oftentimes, we don't know the rest of the story. But I want to talk about one person in particular here, Samuel. Samuel was a judge over Israel. In fact, he was the last judge of Israel. Samuel, 1 Samuel, comes after Judges right? So you got Judges, then Ruth, a little short book, uh, and then, because Ruth takes place during the time of the Judges, and then Samuel, 1 Samuel, then 2 Samuel. Samuel, as I said, was the last of the Judges. God chose him to be a, a ruler over Israel. When I say a judge, don't think of somebody in a, a long black robe who sits on a bench and sentences people to prison. That's not what I'm talking about, okay? He was essentially the, the, a, a political, religious, military, everything leader over Israel. And this was a temporary period in their, their, their history. This is where Samuel was. He was, was actually raised uh, in the temple, and he was more of a religious leader, but he was a leader over Israel. And God spoke to him and spoke through him to the people of Israel. But Samuel had kids who didn't follow in his footsteps. They had issues, and I talked about this last week, so I'm not going to rehash that. But the people of Israel looked at his sons and said, wait a minute, we don't want his dynasty here. We don't want his kids to take over his position. And they looked around the countries around them, and rehashing a little bit last week, just reminding you what we talked about. They said, we want a king like everybody else. And Samuel took that personally. And he went to the Lord in prayer, spent all night in prayer, and, and I think there's more to what this, uh, this passage is talking about, but it, it, it said that, that he prayed unto the Lord. Let me read 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 4 through 6. Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel unto Ramah and said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. Prayed unto the Lord. Now, it doesn't say what he prayed about, but he was upset. We get an intimation of that in the next passage I'll read in just a moment, but I think Samuel took it personally. He was upset that they rejected him and his family and wanted a king like the other nations. Now, see, he spent all night, I think, complaining to the Lord, maybe having a bit of a pity party. You ever been there? You know, you don't have to raise your hand. I think many of us have been at, at different times. But you know, we have to realize what's really going on here. Let me tell you a story about, uh, the, uh, about a young man. I don't know his name, but his pastor was Donald Gray Barnhouse, who was pastor of the 10th Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia from 1927 to 1960. The, the rest of the story that we just heard was about John Calvin, who founded the Presbyterian Church. Well, Donald Gray Barnhouse was a, a, a very conservative we would call him a fundamentalist, Bible-believing Presbyterian pastor. And in 1927, like I said, he took over this church in Philadelphia. One of the young men in his church became a believer after World War I. Remember, that was 1917, 1918, at least as far as the United States was concerned. It actually started in 1914, but it took us a few years to get into that one. But he came back from the war, and he, he had gotten saved at some point while he was in the military, given his life to Christ, 
and there was a huge turnaround in his life. Before he got saved, he was quite the partier. After he got saved, he wasn't. And he started out in the army by giving his testimony before his entire company, all the soldiers he was with. So he was very vocal about his faith, not afraid to share his faith at all. But he was worried when he got out of the military and returned to civilian life, he was afraid that he would fall back into his own old habits again. So he went to his pastor, Pastor Barnhouse, and said, what should I do? How can I make sure that I stay faithful and strong in my faith? And Mr. Barnhouse said, well, I think the thing you should do is give your testimony, just like you did in the military, and if you make it known that you are a believer, I don't think you have to worry about the rest. He said, I think you should give your testimony to the first 10 people that you uh, come across who you used to hang around with. And so he made a commitment to do that. The first 10 people that he met, not just anybody, but the 10 people that he used to party with before he went in the military. And so he didn't have to wait too long. He was on a, on a train shortly after that. When he got off the, the train, on the platform, he ran into a girl he used to know, used to hang around with and party with socially. And she was really excited to see him, came up to him and said, hey, welcome back. When did you get out of the military? Late. We, we need to, to go party again. And so he said, well, I found something I'm even more excited about than partying. She said, what is it? She was all excited. He says, I gave my life to Christ in the military. And she had this, like, a frozen smile on her face. You know, oh, that's nice. And, and mumbled a few pleasantries and then just kind of casually turned and walked away, and he didn't see her again. Not too awfully long after that, he ran into a young man he knew. Very similar scenario. The guy welcomed him back, was really glad to see him, shook his hand, said, hey, we need to get together. We need to hang out, maybe go to the bar, named a bar where they, where they were going to go. And he said, you know, I just want to tell you that something really excited happened, exciting happened to me. The guy says, oh, what was it? He says, I gave my life to Christ. Same thing. Just told him the same testimony. He started talking about it, and the guy, again, had a frozen smile on his face. And so that's nice, and he walked away. After that, he saw few of his other friends because the word got around his old so social circle that he had become a Christian, and so his old friends started avoiding him because they heard that he became a Christian and was giving them his testimony. The word got out that he had become peculiar, that he had become religious, and who knows, he might even be crazy. <laughs> that ever happened to you? But his, his decision to align himself with Christ also aligned him away from his friends. He didn't have to give up his friends. They gave up him. And it wasn't that he wanted to give them up. He wanted to win them to Christ. But their interests diverged. I don't know about you, but that's happened to me. When I uh, got saved and uh, left Ohio State, where all my party friends were, I didn't really part of that much, not that way anyway, but uh, went off to Bible college. When I came back, boy, just all of a sudden, I, 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 I didn't see anybody I could hang around with much. And that was okay. I was running in different circles then. I was wanting to be in church all the time. I loved the youth department, Bible studies. I was here all the time. And my other friends didn't want to be here every night. They wanted to be other places doing other things every night. So that happens, and, and you can feel rejected by that, if you want to feel rejected. But it's a misplaced feeling of rejection because as uh, Samuel learned, it wasn't him they were rejecting, it was God they were rejecting. Just like this young man, his friends really weren't rejecting him, they were rejecting Christ and didn't even want to hear about him. So they made that decision for him. Rejection sometimes is in the eye of the beholder too, isn't it? <clears throat> Excuse me. For some reason, I just the, the thought just went into my head how dry I am after seeing, thinking about that story. <laughs> I shouldn't be thinking those thoughts, but it's interesting what runs through our head, isn't it? But rejection, rejection can sometimes be in the eye of the beholder. I heard a story one time about a young salesman who had gone out and, and tried to sell a prod, 
uh, product uh, it, from his company, and he was not being very successful. People were telling him no. He was getting doors slammed in his face, and he felt like, man, I'm being rejected all the time. I don't think I've ever been rejected this much. And he asked another salesman, why is it that every time I make a call on someone, I get rejected? And the older salesman, who had been there a lot longer, says, well, I don't think I understand that. I've been cursed. I've been spat on. I've had doors shut in my face. Uh, but I've never been rejected. He took it a whole different way, you know. Uh, years ago, uh, we were trained when I was in the youth department to go door to door. And uh, cold calling, we called it. And we, we did surveys. They were, we didn't really care about the survey. You know, the survey was actually a way to get the gospel out to people. We'd ask them where they went to church, you know, how many were in your family, do you have any kids, that kind of stuff. We'd have the address because we'd go door to door and we'd get their name and, and all these different things. And, and that was interesting information that, so we could get them on the mailing list and mail them stuff for the church, right? But, but actually, it led into a conversation. We'd ask them uh, uh, about the gospel. Uh, what, what does your ch- teach, church teach about going to heaven? How can you go to heaven? And if they didn't know, we would explain it to them, you know, so it led into to that type of thing. But it also led to slammed doors because a lot of people knew what we were actually doing. You know, they're not, we're not, they knew we weren't really taking the survey. We're spreading the gospel, right? Inviting people to church. And so doors would slam on our faces a number of times. Now, I never felt personally rejected by that, but it'd be very easy to do so if you're getting doors slammed in your face all the time and people tell you no. And really, that is the main reason why most people don't witness to other people. Most Christians don't witness to other people because they don't want to be rejected. I mean, who wants to be rejected, right? But what we have to realize, it's not us they're rejecting, it's Jesus Christ. That's what this other passage says in 1 Samuel 8, verses 7 and 8. The next verses after the ones I just read, And the Lord said unto Samuel, in response to his prayer, Hearken unto the voice of the people and all that they say unto you, in other words, about making a king. For they have not rejected you, they have rejected me. The reason I think Samuel was depressed and complaining to God is because God said this to him. He is reassuring Samuel, they haven't rejected you. They've rejected me. And I'm sure the Lord didn't feel bad about that. But that I should not reign over them. According to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them up out of Egypt, even unto this day, wherewith they have forsaken me and served other gods, so do they also unto you. In other words, he says, as long as I've known these people, and of course he's known them since Genesis chapter 12, right? Since he called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees and created a new people group, they rejected God continually all through their history. And he says, all the ways that they've treated me since I've known them, they have disobeyed me all along. They're just doing the same thing to you. That's what he's telling them. That's what he's telling Samuel. In essence, what he tells Samuel here is the same thing he says in the New Testament, the servant is not greater than his Lord. So if they reject God, why wouldn't they reject us? After all, we're his ambassadors, we represent him, that flag, his kingdom. When they reject us, they're actually rejecting him. Let's go to our next blank, Hosea, Hosea, H-O-S-E-A, a predetermined pattern of unfaithfulness. A predetermined pattern of unfaithfulness. This is a different kind of rejection. This is the unfaithfulness of a spouse. Some of you have experienced that. And that brings a lot of heartbreak to you. Now, some of you, at some point in your life, probably spent time in prayer asking God to give you the perfect mate. You prayed about it. You didn't just go out bar hopping, looking for just someone who was available. You put intentional prayer into it. You carefully sought the Lord's will, wanting his direction on who that special person is to bring into your life. So you prayed and you prayed and you waited and you waited for Mr. or Miss Wright. And finally, one day, there she was, or there he was. And it wasn't long before you fell in love. You got together, and you began your happily ever after. Just like the fairy tales say. 
But then some time went by, the excitement wore off, daily routine began, and life went on. And then one horrible day, you learned that there was someone else. And right now, even as I speak, you're dredging up feelings of rejection. You remember that hurt. You remember when your emotions exploded from jealousy to anger to grief. And all of it surrounded by a gut-wrenching stress that kept you from sleeping, kept you from eating, kept you from even thinking straight most of the time. And then it hit you. Lord, this is the person I prayed for. Lord, this is the person that, that I trusted you to give me. This was Mr. Right. This was Miss Right. I was sure this was your will for us to get together. What happened? Lord, did you make a mistake? Or was I not listening well? Well, what's going on here? Well, let's talk about someone this actually happened to. The prophet Hosea, he experienced exactly what I just talked about. God chose a mate especially for him. The perfect woman just for Hosea. He picked her out. He gave the name to Hosea and says, I want you to go and marry her. Hosea chapter 1 verse 2. The beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea. And the Lord said to Hosea, Go, take unto thee a wife of whoredoms and children of whoredoms, for the land hath committed a great whoredom, departing from the Lord. Her name was Gomer. Now, when I think of Gomer, I think of the Marines. But, uh, but th this was a, a girl's name back then. Uh, and God told him to marry her. I, I didn't read that verse, but it goes on in the next verse and two. and talks about her. And so he married her. And she was faithful to him at first. In chapter 1 of Hosea, I'm not going to take time to read that, but she has, they have three, there's, well, she has three children. <laughs> uh, and you can tell by their names, and I'm, I'm not going to name them all, but they had, each one had a different name. And if you look up their names in Hebrew, and by the way, in Hebrew, children's names mean something. They have actual meaning to them. So when you look up the children's names, you can tell that the first one was their child, Hosea and Gomer. The second one, the name indicates there's some doubt as to whether this was Hosea's child or not. It was definitely hers, but we're not sure it was his. There was no Mari Povich show back then, so we'll never know. <laughs> and the third one, we can tell by the name that this was, this was Gomer's child, but definitely not Hosea's. So she had started back to her old ways. She got back in the business, you might say. And so Hosea went through this heartbreak that I'm talking about. Most men would have given up on her and gone on without her. I mean, after all, she's a prostitute. You know, who wants to be married to a prostitute? But Hosea may have wanted to give her up, but God had other, other plans. He chose this woman for Hosea. Now, see, he told Hosea to go back and get her. Hosea chapter 1, verse 3 says so she went back to the other lovers she had, but God told him in uh, chapter 3, verse 1, this, Then said the Lord unto me, Go yet, love a woman beloved of her friend, yet an adulteress, according to the love of the Lord toward the children of Israel. What he's saying here, and let me, let me just stop here because it sounds a little confusing. What he's doing is he's casting Hosea in the role of a friend. Now, Hosea is her husband. But he's, he's saying, I want you to go treat her like a friend. A friend would go and, and, and be a friend to her, no matter how you feel about her, no matter how much jealousy you might have, no matter how much bitterness you might have, no matter how much anger you might have, no matter how much resentment you might have, you need to be her friend right now. And you need to go win her back and bring her back to you. He says, according to the love of the Lord toward the children of Israel who look to other gods and love flagons of wine, so I bought her to me for 15 pieces of silver and for a homer of barley and a half homer of barley. And I said unto her, thou shalt abide for me many days, thou shalt not play the harlot, and thou shalt not be for another man, so will I also be for thee. Now, it's not clear from this passage 
whether Hosea uh, bought her out of some form of slavery? The text does not say. And if she was a slave, how in the world did she become a slave? We don't know that. The text isn't clear. We don't know if he bought her out of slavery. We don't know if he just compensated the guy she was living with and just said, hey, you know, let me just give you this. I'll give you some money. I'll give you some food. Uh, just give me my, my wife back. We don't know if that was the case. Third possibility, we don't know if he just rented her as a prostitute like other guys would and just said, okay, if this is your, your business, I'm going to buy you for, that, for now, and then you come back to me. All three of those have scriptural support. We don't know exactly which one it was. But in any case, he brought her home again to be his wife. But here's the rest of the story. The whole point of this marriage was to be a spiritual parallel, a parable, you might say. It wasn't about Hosea at all. It wasn't about him being rejected. God was painting a picture of his own marriage. It was about the Lord, not about Hosea. This was a picture of the Lord's marriage to Israel. In the Old Testament, and I'm, not gonna, I'm just going to say this, I'm not going to explain it and give you all kinds of scripture for it, but in the Old Testament, Jehovah God, the Father uh, of the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the Father was married to Israel. Israel was Jehovah's wife. In the New Testament, the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, he has the church of all believers, you and me, are his bride. We're not his wife yet. That, ha that won't happen until we get raptured, right? Then we'll have the marriage, feast of the Lamb, all that kind of stuff. That, that happens later. But we are the bride of Christ. Israel was the wife of Jehovah. And Israel was very, very unfaithful to God. As I indicated a little bit ago, God, God told Samuel, from the whole time I've known them since I've, since I've known them back in Genesis, they've been unfaithful to me all along. They've constantly rebelled against me. They've gone after other gods, which is a form of adultery. Instead of worshiping the one true God, they were worshiping other gods. That's, that's being unfaithful, right? Oh, they might have still had God as their God. What they were doing is adding other gods to their worship of him too kind of covering their bases, just in case, just in case there's any validity to these other gods, we'll add them to our worship of God. So were they still faithful because God was in the equation? Well, let me ask you this. Yeah, it's 11 o'clock. You won't eat lunch for an hour yet, so I'll give you, this, give you this. You'll probably forget it by the time you eat. If I were to serve you some wonderful delicious chocolate brownies. If I could cook as, as good as Sheila Krebs makes brownies, and everybody loves her brownies, you know, with the, with the nuts on top. If I could make brownies that good, so delicious that everybody would want some, and there was just, just a little bit of cow dung mixed in with it, Would you like them? Wait a minute, just a little bit, maybe 1%. That's all. Still be okay, wouldn't it? I mean, they're 90 cent, 9, 99 cent delicious. They probably still taste just as well. You probably couldn't taste the, the cow dung in it. That'd be okay, wouldn't it? No? Well, you're picky. Well, isn't that kind of the way we are with the Lord? We think, well, I'm mostly faithful. I'm, I'm, I'm even 99% faithful. There's only a little bit of unfaithfulness in me. That'd be okay, wouldn't it? No, it wouldn't be. So what the Lord wants is total devotion from us, doesn't he? Hosea wanted his wife to be faithful to him. God wants his wife to be faithful to him. The Lord Jesus Christ wants his bride to be faithful to him. Even a little bit of unfaithfulness is too much. Jeremiah 3 verse 1 says, They say, if a man put away his wife and she go from him and become another man's, shall he return unto her again? Shall not that land be greatly polluted? But thou hast played the harlot with many lovers, talking about Israel, going after other gods. Yet, he says, yet return again to me, saith the Lord. 
You know what's interesting? The Lord says in Deuteronomy chapter 24, he gives, he gives the rules for divorce. God allows divorce for certain occasions and it's unfaithfulness on the part of, the, of a, one of the spouses. If a spouse is unfaithful, and I think the indication is, you know, if, if, if she's unfaithful once or twice, you know, the Lord said in the New Testament, you're to forgive them. How many times? 70 times seven, right? You're supposed to keep forgiving, keep forgiving, keep forgiving. But the Lord says, because of the hardness of our hearts, because we can't always forgive infinitely like the Lord can. So he gives us an out. Deuteronomy 24. Now don't take this and run with it. Don't think, oh my goodness, I, the, the pastor just said, I, you know, I've got an out. I can just divorce my wife or my husband uh, because of this out. No, that's not what he's saying. But he says, you know, if you can't, if this is repeated, willful, you can, you can do that. There are certain circumstances. But the Lord says, I'm not going to do that with Israel. He did divorce Israel, by the way. We're told in Jeremiah, the Lord actually divorced Israel. But he also brought her back again. That's what this verse is all about. Yet return again to me, saith the Lord. And it's not just about Israel, it's about us. No matter how unfaithful we are, he still brings us back to him. Aren't you glad about that? He doesn't put us away or divorce us and say, I'm done with you. I'm going to go get somebody else. He doesn't do that. And he sticks with us. He remains faithful, even if we're not. Here's your third blank. Jesus himself. Jesus Christ, the predicted plot of betrayal. A predicted plot of betrayal. Have you ever been betrayed by a close friend? Anybody? Ever had somebody that was, that was close to you, somebody you put your trust in, maybe you'd confided in, you'd, you'd done things together and, and, and spent time together and, and had good memories together and, and everything's been great, and then one day they turn on you. One day they, you know, they, they, they make you think they're your best friend and then they will turn on you. Maybe they said, hey, you know, buddy, I got your back. I got your back. You always got to watch it when somebody says that. There's a reason why they say that. Because if they really have your back, they wouldn't have to tell you that. Right? Somebody says that, they've got an agenda. There's something else going on. Right? Those are the ones you have to watch out for. But yeah, I think many of us have been betrayed by someone close to you. In fact, that's the only person who can betray you is someone that's close to you. You know, someone told me years ago, uh, a hard lesson, but I think, well, gosh, it was 19, in the 1970s, uh, someone said that the, the only uh, way to get close to somebody is to become vulnerable to them, open yourself up to them, and, and open up in, in such a way that they know where your soft spots are. And they know how to hurt you. Right? It's the only way to get close to somebody. See, the only people who can hurt you are the ones closest to you. So, yeah, betrayal by a close friend. That happened to Jesus. He knows exactly what that's like. Jesus chose Judas Iscariot to be one of his 12 apostles. Now, it's amazing when you think about it. G Judas was just as close to him as any of the other 11, just as close. They, you couldn't tell them apart as to which one was more devoted to Jesus, which one loved him more, which one served him more. And Jesus gave each of them equal authority to carry out the ministry as he sent them out to preach the gospel, to heal diseases. They could do everything that, that he could Practically, I mean, they couldn't give sight to the blind. Only Messiah could do that. But the other miracles they could do, he could even cast out demons. Judas Iscariot was able to cast out demons. The guy who was later inhabited by Satan himself was able to cast out demons and heal the sick. Now, keep in mind that all these guys were with Jesus just inches away from him for three, three and a half years, traveling from one place to another, walking everywhere they went, spending every meal together, every day together, every trip together. 
You can't be any closer than that. They were so close. The, 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 the goal of, uh, back then was to be so close to a rabbi, and Jesus was a rabbi. The word rabbi is Hebrew for teacher. They wanted to follow him so closely that they would be covered by his dust as he walked along. The dust that he would kick up would, would cover them up. And the more covered up with dust you were, that meant the closer to the rabbi you were. This was their goal. Remember, they all argued with one another over who was going to be closest to him in the kingdom of God, who was going to be sitting at his right hand. They all argued and fought over that. We talked about this this past week in Young Hearts. So much so that even at the Last Supper, the night Jesus was betrayed, they were all gathered around that table, breaking bread together, having the Passover meal. And Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, that one of you here at this table will betray me. Do you remember their reaction? They all said one to another, Who is it? Who could it possibly be? Not one of them said, or the text doesn't tell us, not one of them said, what, you know, one leaned over to another and said, you know, I think it's Judas. He's got that bag over there, and he's always holding that bag, and I, I think I've seen him dip his hand in a till there. I think, I, I, think he, I, I just don't trust him. There's something, there's just, there's something beady about his eyes. You know, he's got the eyes of a thief. There wasn't anybody over here on this side saying, you know, I've got my doubts. I think it's Judas. Have you, have you seen the way he's kind of looked funny at Jesus and kind of given him this, this like a sneer when Jesus said something and like he really wasn't into it? I th I, he's the one I'm worried about. I think it might be him. Not one of them did that. There were no doubts anywhere between any of them about anybody. They all trusted each other with their lives. Not one of them could figure out who it might possibly be. Judas was just as close to him as anybody else. Yet Judas, who probably was trusted more than any others because he took care of the money. That's an indication that he was trusted more than the other 11. And he was the one who proverbially stabbed Jesus in the back. He's the one. I'll bet it shocked the other apostles when that happened. You know, when they were all in the Garden of Gethsemane, except Judas, who was out going out to give money to the poor, so they thought. And while they're all there in the garden, here comes Judas at the head of this procession of soldiers with torches and pitchforks or whatever they were carrying as weapons. They must have been absolutely shocked to see G Judas as the head of this delegation, to arrest Jesus and to betray him with a kiss. Just like a mafia boss would kiss somebody before they gave him two behind the ear. This guy was amazing. Can you imagine the rejection? Now, Jesus knew it was going to happen. He said, it's the guy that I'm going to give a sop to. And he dipped the bread in the dish, gave it to Judas. Nobody thought anything of it because he was doing that for all of them. But Jesus knew exactly who it was it would be. And he knew that when he chose him as one of his apostles. You know what causes the rejection for us is when we don't know in advance. We don't know that that person we've just chosen as our best friend, that we've invested all that time and all those resources and in, invested our emotions in, invested our deepest secrets in, we didn't know in advance, that person would betray us. That makes the hurt all the more deep to us. Jesus wasn't caught by surprise. This was actually a fulfillment of Scripture. Psalm 41, verse 9, Yea, mine own familiar friend, in whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread, hath lifted up his heel against me. But folks, lest we point the finger too harshly at Judas, we need to remember there's three pointing back at us. How many times have we rejected Jesus in favor of maybe a 
a bottle of beer or a cigarette or a pornographic picture? How many times have we rejected Jesus? How many times have we turned our back on him? You know, you may be thinking, I don't think I've ever done that. Folks, every one of us has rejected him. When he was crucified on a cross like that, he was suspended between heaven and earth, rejected by both. Everyone fled from him in heaven. Even God, his father, couldn't bear to look on his own son, so he drew the curtain of clouds and darkness across the sea for the space of three hours on crucifixion day. And at the same time, everybody down here had rejected him as well. Even his apostles turned tail and ran. Can you imagine the rejection he felt on the cross? Even when he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Yet in the midst of all that rejection, he still chose to love us. All the rejection that we go through, all the betrayal that we go through, all the hurt that we go through, it may not be pleasant, but you know, I think the Lord uses all those situations to test us, to try us. Like a refiner refines gold or assays it to see how pure the gold is. There are ways that a jeweler can determine whether your ring is 12 carat, 14 carat, 20 four karat gold or whatever the most is. Uh, pure gold is 24, isn't it? Pure gold? Yeah. I don't, how they figured that out? I'm not quite sure, but there's a way to figure that out. And, and God tests us all the, at the same time as well. Job chapter 23, verse 10. It, was anyone never tested as much as Job was? Yet he says, but he knoweth the way that I take when he hath tried me or tested me, assayed me, is what, is what the word means in Hebrew, I shall come forth as gold. And James closes it out by saying in chapter two, uh, one, chapter two, one, chapter one, verses two through four, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers. The King James says temptations, but the word is actually testing. Remember that the Lord tests us to bring us up. Satan tempts us to bring us down. He says, count it joy when you fall into different testings, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have it perf her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. And then Peter says this in chapter 1, wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, or many testings, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. In other words, I think all the testings that we go through in life, and what we're talking about today with rejection, betrayal, is just a sample of those testings that he puts us through. Almost everything that we go through in life that, that qualifies as an adversity is, a, is like a spiritual battle. It's a testing of our faith. How are we going to respond to this thing I'm going through? And we always need to look to the Lord to get us through that, knowing, knowing that the Lord never allows us to go through something that he hasn't already experienced himself. And that is the rest of the story. Let's stand with our heads bowed. All right.